My name is Sunil Bagai. I'm the CEO of Crowd Staffing. And this morning we're going to talk a little bit about hiring automation. And when we talk about hiring automation, we're looking at the full life cycle of recruiting and talent acquisition to figure out how do you identify the right individual to hire and really automate that process over its life cycle, right? And there are many steps involved. And to do it effectively, we believe that there are many ways to do it, including machine algorithms, network effects, and also human intelligence. So it's really a combination of all that really makes it possible. And we're gonna go through that today in this presentation. So I hope you're ready, hope you're excited. I'm absolutely happy and excited to be here with you and hopefully engage in a dialogue. My majority of this presentation content is designed to educate about this topic, right? And some of it at the end will talk about our solution as well, how we're addressing some of these areas. So that's my goal today. Is that cool? All right. So why does hiring feel like a pinball game? You know, where candidates feel like they're jolted around, they're that ping pong ball, where clients, they put in a quarter and press the button and they really don't know what results they're gonna get, right? For some reason, the outcomes of hiring are not really mapped to the outcomes of the talent that they produce always, right? And there's a struggle there to find a way to make those al things aligned over a period of time, right? And that's where it is. But what we also think about is, shouldn't hiring really feel like this? Shouldn't people feel engaged, excited? More importantly, you know, candidates are looking for positions in which they can find meaning and purpose and perhaps fulfillment. That's the end goal, right? And clients are looking for individuals that are gonna make an impact, right? That are gonna hopefully drive better outcomes and also create a better environment for the organizations that they're in, right? So that's the end goal, is finding those ways to happen more effectively, right? And what we're finding for the industry right now Key staffing executives are saying things like this. Staffing companies must become software companies in the next 10 years or they'll no longer be relevant. How about the next one? To stay competitive, we have to make major changes. Any advantage we had is quickly eroding. Now these are staffing CEOs, CIOs talking about this, right? And there, we're talking not just smaller organizations, but the ones I've spoken to are multi-billion dollar organizations, right? They realize that the process needs to evolve. Otherwise, they're not going to be relevant. And so they're looking at a lot of different solutions. And they ask themselves, well, what's the right model? We ask ourselves, what's the right model? How should you build a staffing solution or a hiring solution or a talent acquisition solution today and for tomorrow? Well, to get some inspiration on how this could be possible, you could look at companies like Uber and Airbnb. And you ask yourself, well, how would they build a, a solution for hiring? Well, let, first of all, let's examine what they are. Now, Uber and Airbnb, you have to ask yourself, are they a business model? Are they a service offering? Are they a technology platform? The reality is they're all of the above. They're all of the above. And for the first time, you're finding companies have solutions that are almost stacked on top of each other to create greater intrinsic value to the end user that did not exist before. In the case of a, com a company like Uber or Airbnb, they're servicing not just their clients. Their clients are individuals that rent properties as well as users that you know, hopefully will be staying at the properties if they're Airbnb. It, riders and drivers, right, and so on. It's a multi-sided marketplace, uh, an ecosystem, if you may, right? And that's the interesting way to think about an organization like Uber or Airbnb. They're building marketplaces, connecting two sides together. Now the question is, why hasn't that happened in staffing yet? By the way, we have thought about this long and hard for the last several years, and we realize the problem is hard. It's extremely challenging, and that's why it's not happening in staffing. When you're looking at giving a ride to a, drive, a driver, matching them to a rider, it's easy. You know that what a driver is, you know what a rider is. 
how about two human beings? Are 10 software engineers, if you put them into a room, are all of them the same? No, they're just not. One could be working on one type of technology, one could be working on a different type of industry. It's just not the same. And that presents the challenge. And we're gonna talk about a number of things that kind of really show why this is so challenging, and that's how we're gonna address this first. Uh, one more thing I'll say about Uber and Airbnb. This is the marketplace slide. They have a, a crowd to deliver the service offering, a technology platform to facilitate the offering. This is the matching algorithms, the payments, the marketplace itself, the ratings, the reviews. All of that is important, and then customers to use it. So it's a marketplace. Now the thing is, you have to ask yourself, are they a software as a service? Are they a technology? Are, what I start calling them from a new terminology perspective is they're really a software enabled service. They still charge as a service, but if it wasn't for that platform, that service wouldn't be possible. True? Yes? All right, so first thing you gotta do, in our opinion, is you have to solve for data quality. And that's the biggest issue in our industry. We're gonna talk a lot about that. Second thing you gotta do, and why it's so challenging, is you have to utilize a broad range of technology. Third, you have to then harness machine, network, and human intelligence. Finally, you have to develop an ecosystem. And then you ask yourself, well, who's done all this? Not really anybody yet, right? And that's where the challenge is. It's very complicated. I'm gonna talk through all of this and, and explain. So let's talk about solving for data quality. Why is data quality an issue? Well, if you think about it, most of us start with a job description. And how many of us have seen a, a perfect job description? Anybody? I can't tell you how many times I've seen a, a job description that is very generic, maybe three lines, and then we're supposed to identify a human being that matches to that job description, right? Now here's the thing, garbage in, garbage out. You'll never be able to do effective matching algorithms, machine learning, if you don't even have a good place to start, right? And you have to solve for data quality. So what's the first step? We're gonna talk about 10 areas to solve for data quality, right? First, data collection. Let's assume you get a resume. That's a collection of data. But it could be a LinkedIn profile. It could be a GitHub repository information. It really doesn't matter where you start. First step is you gotta start collecting. Is that fair? Cool? Second, let's say you've collected data, some information. For, next thing you're doing is starting to assess it. How complete is the data? What fields are missing? Are there information like contact information available ex easily, readily, like email, phone number, et cetera, right? What other information can we actually utilize to make a better informed decision about that person? So that's first, second thing you're doing is assessing for completeness. And, and at that stage, by the way, you're gonna start thinking about a score for that candidate, especially if you wanna automate, right? You're thinking about how complete is this profile. Third, you're starting to standardize. If you're building a system internally to do this effectively, you have to standardize into a form that basically allows you to collect many disparate types of data information into one standard methodology. Is that fair? So far so good? Fourth, we call this data harmonization, enrichment. Okay, so let's talk about a case. You have a candidate, a software engineer, you get his resume from Monster or Career Builder. It doesn't matter where you get the resume. Bring it in, you standardize, you create it into a template, you put it into your application, whatever system you're using. The next step is how do you enrich that data? Enrichment means how, what other sources can I pull information from to allow me to get a better view on this candidate? So that could be a LinkedIn profile, it could be a Facebook, it could be a many other sources of information that exists. The key is this, we're not limited today. Many of us do a lot of that sourcing manually. Why not automate that? Bring in that information, merge it, deduplicate it from multiple sources, even multiple talent pool providers, create one common profile. Make sense? And then the enrichment is essential because you're getting richer data. You're getting more information to make quality decisions. Many candidates have a profile on one place and then they have 
same profile for hiring in another place, but different data. Why is that? So if you have an Upwork profile as a freelancer, for example, you have ratings and reviews, right? You have compensation history. Well, that could be interesting information to have in a combined format. Does that make sense? Next, classifying data. So let's say you've collected a lot of information. You're starting to enrich it. You've standardized the templates. The next step is classify, meaning is this a, a software engineer? OK, that's good. That's a classification. Next level, what type of software engineer? Next level, how much experience? Really start honing in on subsets and subcategories and classifying that information effectively. Now you understand why this is challenging, right? Because you need different technologies to think about different approaches here. Finally, we're getting to data matching. If you have a good job description, again, that's the first place you solve, then you start scoring here and matching to different jobs and also different recruiters and also different clients. So this is where matching can happen in all dimensions, right? And the scoring, the, by the way, the further along you get in this life cycle, the scoring gets better, right? You trust the score more at later stages because early on, the scores are a guess. And that's why matching doesn't work. If you ever speak to a talent pool provider, ask them one question, how much of this are they doing? Because just because they have an aggregate of data doesn't mean Jack, right? Anybody can go to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the largest aggregation of a talent pool in the world. But how good is that data from a matching perspective? If, if, they, if that was the right source, everybody would only be using LinkedIn. But that isn't. And that's the challenge. So you have to go further along. And by the way, the next couple of stages are where people get involved. The next stage is data authentication. So assume that the candidates are in your database or in your application. Now you've gone through all this process. The next step is getting the candidate to verify their information. To say, yes, that is me. Yes, this information collected is accurate. I authenticate it. I opt in. And more importantly, I am self-selecting and say, I am a software engineer. I am a Ruby developer. I am a so-and-so. And this is correct. I also have the ability to edit my own record, to update it. Does that make sense? That's essential. They have to be part of the process. Many of the algorithms, unfortunately, do not include candidates part of the process. And if they're not part of the process, the score is just based on a machine which may not be accurate. Is that fair? Next, verification. What is verification? This is where assessments come in, where you can actually use third-party tools to assess, you can use a game, a test, a quiz. A, there's many different technologies you can plug in here to say really what is the competency at a skill level of this individual. You could also start adding in layers like culture fit, personality profile, and so on. Does that make sense? Again, more dimensions for the data. Helps enhance the quality. Final step, again, human involvement. Data curation. This is where a human being will say, OK, I've had a chance to see the top ranked profiles that match this job. And out of the 20, I really think these are the best three for a variety of reasons. Remember, they have a merged profile. They have enriched data. They have scores. They have matching. They have everything is done. Why that's useful is because the machine has done a lot of the work if you've done this right and automated much of this process up to this point. And now you can get humans involved to curate. Is that fair? There are other steps where humans get involved from a recruiting perspective. We're going to cover that in a little bit. Okay? But I'm just stating the fact that you need at least a curation layer at the end. And that's what completes the data quality process. So far, so good? So if you've done all this, you're in good shape. If you do some of these things, that's good. But ask yourself, what could you be doing better, more effectively in these areas to improve data quality? Next step. If you're in talent acquisition, you understand our industry is filled with technology. There's new technology popping up every single day. And you have to really look at all of this technology to solve the challenges of talent acquisition in a meaningful way. right? 
And these are some of the areas that I've identified. Job creation, job distribution candidate search, candidate data collection, artificial intelligence, talent relationship management, on-demand talent, applicant tracking, candidate assessment, onboarding compliance, vendor management, and so on. I don't think this is a, a full list, but we're gonna go through some of it. And this is why it's so hard. There are companies in each of these silos that all they do is specialize in these silos, right? For example, job creation, there are technologies, and these are some of the ones that are listed. I'm really not trying to endorse anybody or state that they're the right solution. I'm just stating that they exist to solve that problem. Is that fair? But these are organizations, and what they do is they create wizards. They help you with the job creation process. They have essentially templates and ways to make a better job description that is more meaningful, richer data at the beginning step, right? This moves you to step one, which is creating an effective job. And you can utilize one or multiple of these companies to help you in that process. And hopefully, some of this technology is already integrated into the technologies you're using today, right? Second, job distribution and candidate search. Now this is a, an area that many of us spend time, whether it's a LinkedIn, whether it's a career builder, whether it's a Dice, or you're, you're basically sending postings out to get more candidates in or searching those databases. But that's a process, it's an active process, and some of it can be automated as well, right? So you're utilizing these types of technologies to reach candidates more effectively. Third, candidate data collection. Now there are some technologies that help you collect millions of records very effectively. We acquired a company called NetIn that d does exactly that. It had a repository of 150 million candidates and had also scraping technologies where it would go and scrape data from many public sources, whether it's a LinkedIn, a GitHub, Stack Overflow, it doesn't matter. Many sources, it aggregates the data and puts it in, right? But there's others. Talentpin is a solution from uh, Monster, then there's uh, People Data Labs, there's many, right? But this is another element that's essential. It's not about just having access to a active job board, but also collecting data passively in many sources so you can bring it in. Make sense? Now we're starting to get into some fun technology. Artificial intelligence. How many of you really believe that artificial intelligence is gonna solve talent acquisition? You do. Anybody else? Yes? Okay, and my viewpoint on that is it's gonna play a role, probably a significant role, but it isn't the end all be all that we all think it is. Does that make sense? And I'll tell you why. It does help in profile scoring. It does help in creating matching engines, right? But one thing that AI depends on is a multitude of data, right? When you have a lot of data, and by the way, what's a lot? We're talking millions and millions and millions of records. The machine needs something to learn from. That's why it's called machine learning, right? It learns in multiple ways. One, by understanding the data itself, sifting through it, finding the patterns, but two, through user interactions, right? In the case of how this could work is that recruiters would be interacting with that data and the machine is learning and watching and basically updating its algorithms accordingly. So it helps. It also can, you know, you can do things like chatbots, where you can automate a certain segment of your process. How about like interviews? Interview scheduling even, right? Those are things that I think AI can help with and will solve for some of those areas. But beyond that, I believe it's limited in scope today. 10 years, like Mr. Wade said earlier in his talk, I agree that AI is gonna evolve to a point where it will be very human-like. Ray Kurzweil, from, uh, he's the head of artificial intelligence at Google, gave a talk recently where he was talking about how, you know, in 10 years, you'll probably not be able to perceive the difference in a conversation over, let, let's say, chat, whether you're speaking to a human or an AI. And the reason why is higher order of, uh, of complexity, such as humor, are not possible today, right? Just the nuances are not there today, but they will be over the period of the next 10 years, right? But we can still automate certain elements very effectively using AI today, right? But just have to be careful that it is not the end all be all. It's still an evolutionary progress. 
Talent relationship management is another technology area that we're spending a lot of time, energy, effectively not just you know, getting the candidates into our database, then figuring out who's active, who's passive, who's really ready for an opportunity. How do we get front of mind with them by creating a nice brand presence, right? How do we create content that could be meaningful for them so that they want to engage with us and work with us? And this is a tool that allows us to manage that entire process. Email funnels, marketing campaigns, a lot of insights and so on that we can really in insert into the process to make candidates feel like this is, uh, you know, they want to work for that organization. Does that make sense? So this is another technology where people are investing. Went to an organization about six months ago and I asked them, you know, what are the key areas they're investing in? They said, this is one. And I said, how much are you spending? Just on this one solution alone, they're about to spend a quarter million dollars, right? So each of these areas, you have to spend a significant investment to make a complete offering. And the question is, are they working together? Are they integrated? On-demand talent. This is where you start looking at companies like, you know, they have talent pools that are ready to be hired. They're essentially vetted, curated, hopefully assessed, and now they're to, you know, platforms and marketplaces that offer these to, you know, to, to organizations like Vettery, HackerRank, Hired, a number of them are, are, are essentially prominent today and solving this as a problem, right? It's exciting because they, in certain segments, offer a great offering. They're, these individuals are, are really the cream of the crop for that particular niche. Data science, software engineering in certain areas, right? Unfortunately, they're not very broad solutions. They can't help you hire for multiple position types at any given time today. They're expanding quickly, but many of them are very specialized. You guys seeing some of them pop up? Yep. Applicant tracking. I'm assuming this entire room is using some form of an applicant tracking system, correct? And many of the companies here are also evolving, you know, are like Job Divas here, and I think others uh, are here, Bullhorns here. So there are a number of companies that are specialized in tracking the entire workflow of applicants and ensuring that process works very smoothly, right? So this scenario, we don't have to spend time, but there's a number of companies in this area. You have to make an investment here as well. Candidate assessment. And this is where we plug in tests, assessments, and a number of ways to assess the quality of that candidate from a skill perspective or a culture fit perspective. And then onboarding and compliance. Once the person is hired, then you have technology to help automate the offer process, essentially to ensure that they have a very smooth onboarding and you can manage their compliance after the fact, right? Final step, vendor management. And vendor management we're familiar with, we work in the VMS MSP space, so we know that there are organizations that focus on it, helping with that entire process, and they have technology and as well as services solutions that basically make that possible. Now here's a question, what have I missed? If you look at the technology ecosystem, what's a gap that I haven't covered? Any particular technology come to mind? Okay, looks like I'll take that as it's pretty comprehensive. Would you agree that majority of this technology is necessary today to be able to effectively manage the entire talent acquisition process? Yes? How many of you guys are doing each of these things or many of these things? Anybody? Some of these things, yes, everybody, but not all, okay? And that's the challenge, and that's what makes it complex. That's what makes it hard, is to do it all, is an investment, it's hard, and it makes it challenging. My belief is this, you can't even get to harnessing machine, network, and human intelligence effectively until you've solved all those areas first. But once you do, you really can start having higher order of fun. So let's talk about some of these other new areas. Machine intelligence, everyone talks about this. It's growing exponentially. We talked a little bit about this earlier, which is that machines can solve a number of problems effectively. For example, they're really great at automating mundane and repetitive tasks, right? 
So for example, data collection, harmonization, matching algorithms, process and workflow management, candidate engagement, nurturing, you can do a lot of that through the machine, right? It, you'll also find that intelligent algorithms will give you better insights. So while a score may not be the final judgment on a candidate, it's still an insight, right? And therefore, it gives you more meaningful information to look at, right? You're also getting better reporting and so on through some of these methodologies. What you'll also find is that once you get the basic methodologies of machine learning in place, longer term, you can build in incentive structures, gamification, ratings, reviews, and so on, again, automated through the machine, right? But it's a stepping stone. You have to get to first base and second base and third base and then eventually get to home, right? And right now, I think majority of the industry is not even at first base. That, that's a fact. But it's a, it's a place to think about, and hopefully you're at least starting to explore some of the solutions at the basic level. Now, he, here's an area I get excited about, which is the network effect. And here's the thing. A network effects when you combine many groups together to solve a problem in, in, and come up with a collective solution to that problem, right? And it means when you have mul millions of candidates, talent suppliers, talent pool providers, all in one ecosystem, including talent clients, right? Why is it that we're all disconnected in our industry? Why is it that we use silos of information? Why is it that we have silos of technologies that we all utilize that are not working in tandem to solve the same problem? We have insights on one candidate in this place and another candidate on this place. Why are we not combining it? When we do, we get what's called a, a, a benefits of a network effect, which is hyper reach to candidates, hyper scale, hyper diversity, hyper accuracy, and so on. And, and my belief is eventually hi, hi, better outcomes. And that's where we get excited. And you start overlaying this network effect on, on newer exponential network technologies like blockchain, and all of a sudden, it opens up a brand new world that's not possible today, okay? And, th and I think that's where it's gonna get exciting over the next few years. And finally, human intelligence. Human intelligence is still superior and no matter what others will tell you, machines have not taken over just yet. And let's ask ourselves why. So depending on the algorithms, machines are effective anywhere from 30 to 80% at matching accurately. That's a gap. That's a big delta. And the challenge is you just don't know, right? And for the rest of the time, you need, you need human touch points. And human touch points are really important for two main reasons. One, they enhance the candidate experience. You still want to be able to touch that candidate and have a conversation and candidates feel good about that. They're uncomfortable today just talking to a machine and only you know, being able to do a video interview, right? They still want to know what is that person like that I'm gonna work with? What's, what more can I learn about that environment? And then second, a human is still gonna today be able to far more effectively be able to assess the candidate. Is this the right person? What's the motivation level? Why are they seeking this job versus another job? You know, are they really gonna be a good fit for my environment? So I don't think you can eliminate that for the near future because so much of the technology still needs to catch up. And, and my belief is instead of thinking of one or the other, why not think of both? Right? Where, where machines will take you so far, how do you f seamlessly integrate the human touch so that essentially you get a better experience overall? Does that make sense? So, uh, you know, a few things that I mentioned here. Humans' use of language, inflection, tone, emotion, much more comprehensive than machines. B being able to distill information, reading between the lines. Right? There are so many ways that we communicate today that are not obvious to machines. Right? It's like black and white. Deciphering of motivations, all of those things are essential. Humans still are better. 
Step four, developing an ecosystem. So my belief is ecosystems are really going to be the future. And what ecosystems allow you to do is connect various technologies together. First you have a technology ecosystem and then on top of that you have a network or people ecosystem on top of that, right? Technology ecosystems will be integrated through APIs, platforms speaking to platforms. For example, we just announced a, a partnership with Beeline in which we're integrating our platform with their platform and that allows for seamless integration and, and better experience, right? Technology integration make that happen. But it's not just going to be point to point, it's going to be, you could say, across the board. Right? And that's key to understand. It enables for all these disparate silos of technologies to work together. And that's important because if you made a, an investment in one technology and somebody else made an investment in another, well, how do they work? What you're forcing companies to do as a vendor, if you have many technologies, you force them to become the integrator. And how many of these companies are really savvy at IT and can integrate technologies together effectively? I can tell you from personal experience, they're having a hard time just integrating their ERP systems. And they're not even thinking about talent acquisition technology today, right? And that's where we are as an industry. So APIs are essential connection, but then the second is various users to collaborate on the same unified system. Now here's the thing, why is it that recruiters use a different ATS than clients? Does that make sense? Shouldn't we be asking ourselves that question? Why do we all use different systems? Couldn't we be collaborating in a unified system that allows for better experience for all parties, right? And then finally, I think, you know, we're really at the infrastructure stage. No matter what people tell you, it's, it's still early. It's like the pipeline that we're building is the early internet today. But if we build this today, then we are allowed to do, over, over time, going to do a lot more amazing things on top of that infrastructure, right? Here's our vision of a hiring ecosystem. Here's how we imagine the world. First, in the middle, you have the entire population of talent. We call that talent.earth, right? And you just assume that you're going to have everybody in your talent pool. Just make that assumption, right? In our case, again, we did acquire a company called NetIn that allows us to have 150 million candidates that we're populating into our town pool. So that's a good start. But nowhere do we ever say that that's good enough. Because engaging, nurturing, figuring out which talent is actually active and ready to be hired for a particular opportunity, that's where the hard work is. Collecting data is just step one, right? On the left side, you'll see that there's something called talent pool providers. We have a large collection of talent but we also expect to integrate in many other talent pools into our ecosystem. Why? Because if you're a university, you have access to talent that maybe others do not. If you're a, a Coursera, Udemy, online learning platform, you have talent pools. You could be a, you know, a organization that is looking for a redeployment strategy that has access to a talent pool, and so on. So talent pool providers are companies that have some sort of a technology ability to be able to integrate in and allow us to have access and we're gonna aggregate them, qualify them, uh, enrich that talent and offer it into our ecosystem. Third, on the, right, uh, on the right side is the talent supplier network. These are the recruiters, the staffing agencies, the organizations that are gonna essentially communicate with that talent to assess, qualify, nurture, you know, just essentially build that relationship to say that's the right person to hire, right? All of that plugs into what we call an which is our platform, the Talent Market Exchange. And that is where you have a, a full technology stack. And we're gonna go through what that looks like in a moment. But that's where you basically have all those disparate technology areas combined into one ecosystem. And that plugs right into our hiring organizations. And we plug in in, in multiple ways through MSP VMS programs as well as directly into client organizations, right? This is what we're aiming to really bring to our industry. And we see it as a collaborative effort, not necessarily as we're solving it all, but in partnership with everybody in the industry. And it doesn't matter who, whether it's a staffing agency, whether it's an MSP organization, whether it's a client, we really want to build an ecosystem and champion this into something that's effective for everybody. Does that make sense? So let me now spend a few minutes on, on crowd staffing, because most of our 
you know, presentation to this point has been really about just educating about how this could work more effectively. And I'll give you a little glimpse into how we're thinking about solving this, right? The how part, right? First, what is CrowdSafe? We're building a marketplace, which is a talent acquisition marketplace for organizations to be able to hire talent. So remember I showed you that slide about Uber and Airbnb and their marketplace? So in our view of the world, the crowd at the top is a global network of talent suppliers and talent pool providers. We have our own, but there's many others that we partner with. And that's what makes it valuable, right? And we're having some very interesting conversations. I'll give you an example. There's one client that we're starting to work with that is uh, you know, a 2,000 person company, $25 million of staffing spend, and they have zero ATS technology, no VMS. They're too small for the majority of the companies. But they need something. And we're pl gonna plug them in, we're gonna do a pilot with them in the next month. And what we're doing is working with staffing organizations that they're already working with, plugging them into our ecosystem as a talent supplier partner, as well as allowing them to basically use our technology to really find the right talent. And they have expertise in the niche areas for that organization, right? That's creating value for a particular client that did not exist today. In our model, what we do in the middle is we have our technology plus curation on our end. We have a team that's all they do is curate, and then we also play the role of employer of record as, as, as and when needed. And then we plug in right into enterprise and contingent workforce programs. So why a large crowd? Why many suppliers? Because there's diversity in the crowd. Somebody's an expert in IT, somebody's an expert in finance, somebody's an expert in engineering, and you can get better coverage. And the thing is, the way it works is, as we receive positions into our platform, we broadcast them to a large network of suppliers and talent pool providers. They then re return candidates back into our platform, which we then curate and vet and submit them back onto the client, right into their technology platform. If they're using a VMS, we'll connect and put it right into there. And what happens is, you know, through this methodology, we're able to get better reach, better speed, better accuracy, and at the end of the day, it's about finding the right talent for the organization on demand. And that's what we're able to facilitate. How does it compare? You know, I'm not really gonna spend a lot of time here, but if you look at scalability, speed, quality, recruiter motivation, the support that we provide, we do very well in everything except for freelance because that is just not an area that we specialize, right? But everything else, we're, we're building it to scale, solving the speed challenges and so on. Working with many well-known clients, uh, we've been proving the model for the last several years. The effect is staggering. If you look at one of our top clients, we became the number one supplier in that program. And if you look at the scorecard results, they tell a story. That same client this year has done a tiering in the organization. They have a tier one, tier two. In tier one, they have about three to five select suppliers. Out of the 11 categories, I'm sorry, 15 categories, 11 of them we were basically tier one, number one supplier, and then basically in, in four, tier two. And that's just as of January. So it gives you a sense of what's possible. And by the way, we have zero recruiters of our own, right? We, we, we don't, we're not a recruiting company. It's all through our ecosystem that we're able to solve this for our clients, right? Using a technology-enabled approach and uh, an ecosystem approach. We only focus on IT engineering and professional roles, which is essential. They're the primary area that we focus. So we don't do light industrial, maybe some of the higher level light industrial perhaps, but uh, we don't do clinical. But that's where we're planning to over time use our ecosystem to help us evolve that. Because we don't need to be, perhaps be specialists in all those categories. We can use partners to help us in those areas, right? 100% uh, U.S. and Canada coverage, plans to go international in 2000, uh, 2019 beyond North America. And, and again, our hiring ecosystem, and I'll give you a little bit more insight there. Netin, 150 million candidates, that's the talent.earth, and our talent pool providers are third-party organizations that provide talent with niche skills. And what we do is bring it into our platform where the data is categorized, assessed, matched, enriched, and therefore the, the candidate profile 
is ready to be hired at that point, you know. Uh, clients can create and manage their own talent pools as well. So this is the where you get the private talent pool ac access versus the public. If you want to access ours, that's fine as well. What we believe is this is where it starts to get exciting, is that you can tap into the power of the crowd. So it's a combo approach, not just the talent itself, but really the ecosystem that helps you enrich that talent. So staffing agencies and RPOs, enterprises, candidate referrals, universities, recruiting partners, all can add to that talent pool. You can really start getting wide access to people and, and the right people at, that, at this point. In our, in our case, we have over 700 participants in our ecosystems, and the synergies start producing what we call a network effect. And we're at the beginning stages of really creating a massive effect in that respect, right? It's getting exciting. And finally, the talent market exchange. All these technology areas are what we're trying to solve here, right? The entire ecosystem that we talked about earlier. And understand one thing. Our philosophy is a little you know, different. We're not trying to be the best in any one of those areas, right? That isn't our aim. We want to solve the broad picture. Take the 20% of the features and functionality that is absolutely vital, critical, essential, and it creates 80% of the value. And we hone in on that in each of those domains, right? And that way we can solve it from front to back, end to end, right? And some of the same services that we're able to offer because of it are listed here. And this completes the entire picture. By the way, we're specializing in contingent workforce. And some of the MSP partners we're working with, many of them are here in this, in this conference, you know, we're able to basically plug in and provide all of this as an engine behind our platform to be able to really solve for MSP challenges. And we can in some ways be a, be a MSP to the MSP, right? Where we can basically do things like supplier consolidation, supplier management, scorecarding, uh, because we have all the analytics built in, right? We can, and, and that way it saves the MSP from things like too many cold calls. I can't get you into the program, right? Well, you can get people into the crowd and they could still perform without adding another contract, right? And that's what makes it interesting and exciting because we're able to really create a network effect even for the MSPs by just being able to offer us as a service and all the suppliers can plug in immediately and add value. Right? And what's interesting to suppliers is that not only could they service that one client, but in our ecosystem they can service many other clients. Right? And that's the beauty, is the opportunity gets richer and hopefully even better as more and more clients can come on board, more and more suppliers come on board. Remember this earlier? This is a, a maze, right? That if you get to the end, you finally get the prize. Right? There's a lot of steps here. To do this effectively, you have to think about the entire end-to-end -end aspect of what we're trying to solve. And just to give you a glimpse of how we're thinking about this, this is where we are today. It gives you a sense. Many of the pieces are in place. Some are coming in the next six months, and then others are coming in the next year. This is our roadmap because we believe in this vision of solving it end to end. And if we do, then you basically build a solution that is effectively helping you get the right talent all the time. Not just some of the time, all the time. And it's not really possible unless you address many of these areas simultaneously in parallel, right? And the question I'll ask you is how many of you, these items are you doing? How effectively are they working, right? Are they integrated steps or, or are they silos? If they're silos, you don't have perfect data, believe me. You don't have the right reports and information because it's not pieced together, right? How much are you spending? Are you hiring the right people? That's the outcome. Are you hiring the right people effectively? And then finally, are you open to partnering? Because we believe we can be much more effective as an ecosystem in tandem. Thank you. Thank you.